Welcome to St. Stephen's. Welcome to those sparsely who are here in the pews. Last week we had a bunch of people in church. This week sparse. Next week, guess what? It's going to be pretty full. I'll talk about that in a second. Welcome to everybody who's joining us through live stream. It is great to have you joining us in whatever way you can. Uh, so just a few announcements, and I did kind of give you a little sneak peek about what's happening next week. Uh, Bishop Tom is coming for his official visit next Tuesday, uh, next Sunday, next Sunday, not next Tuesday, next Sunday. Um, so we're very excited about that. There will be confirmations. We have seven people who are either being confirmed or received or reaffirmed. So we're very, very excited about that. That'll be happening next Sunday. So it's always fun when Bishop Tom is here. That is a potluck afterward, too. So please on up bringing along some food for our potluck. Maybe some vegan food, that would be really good. Someone bring some vegan food. I'll have to bring some vegan food. Anyway, uh, that'll be happening next week. But before then, of course, um, we did have a, a loss kind of in our family. Of course, uh, Dorothy Laburn passed away on Friday. Some of you know Dorothy. Uh, her family were or longtime members here at St. Stephen's Hale and Barbara Laburn were members here many, many years ago. Uh, her Requiem Mass will be held here sometime this week. We'll find out tomorrow. As you know, she is a cousin of James McKay, our organist. So uh, it's been kind of a hard couple of days for your family, hasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, be praying for the repose of her soul. Be praying for her children, Allison and Jordan. And uh, yes, like I said, uh, you'll hear more information about the Requiem this coming week. Oh, uh, let's see what else is going on. Of course, we do have our annual meeting coming up on January 30th. We had a great budget meeting yesterday. Uh, Laura, do you want to share a little bit about some of the good news of our budget meeting? Actually, it was all good news. It was a good it was, meeting yesterday. It was all very good news. And thank you, thank you, thank you yes. to the people who returned their pledges and were generous in their spirit of giving. Um, we really appreciate that. We could still use some more time and talent pledges. Yes. Um, that would be a great help as well, and it's never too late to do those. Um, but there are a few people still who um, perhaps have uh, monetary pledges to turn in. If that's the case for you, just send me an email um, and we'll make sure that that gets recorded. Our budget meeting was actually fairly simple. It was, yes. We, we do have Sometimes you, in the past, we went into that budget meeting going like, okay, what's gonna be happening in this? That was not the case this week, or this no, year. So no, it, was a, it was a really good budget meeting. Great, but uh, again, you know, be generous in your spirit of giving. And Definitely. Yes. And so if we would like to eventually pay Jamie full time. It would <laughs> that would be a, that's a good goal to work toward. Yeah. Um, but uh, what it, what is great is if any of you if anybody hasn't pledged yet and you you're going like oh I didn't pick up my card, you can just send an email to Laura with your information about how much you would like to pledge in the year. She will make sure that it's taken care of, and she's the only one who sees that. Nobody else sees that. So that is uh, that is good. Uh, thank you, Laura, for the, for your comments on that. Uh, we also have a vestry meeting today. If there's anything that you would like on our agenda for the vestry meeting, just talk to our senior warden, John Baird, who is walking in the door right now, or talk to me. We can make sure that happens for you, so we'll, we'll make sure it goes on the agenda. Uh, also, I am going to be on vacation. I'm going to be on vacation from February 3rd through the 27th. We're, so I'm sure you're all really excited about that. Uh, you're going to be having a little variety of preachers and uh, presiders, kind of. You'll have some, a little variety anyway on that. I'll give you more information about that as we get closer to that time. But uh, yeah, you get a vacation from me as well. So that's a good thing. Uh, do you think I can share a little bit about a certain wedding coming up? Okay. So Annette Morrow and Mark Hitterdahl are getting married on February 26th. And so please be praying for them as they prep for the wedding. Do you like how it really looks to you? Like all of a sudden I was like saying it was your wedding. That's not what I meant. It's, it's Amy's mom's wedding. It's not Amy's wedding. So, but they kind of got that look for a moment like, oh, no, it's, uh, it's uh, Annette and, and Mark are getting married on the 26th of February. Uh, it will be here at St. Stephen's. Everybody is invited to that wedding. So it is going to be very, very exciting. I think it's 2 o'clock in the afternoon. That's a Saturday, the 26th of February. 
Uh, even though I'm officially still on vacation, I'm coming back for that one. So that would be a lot of fun. So that is the 26th, and you'll be hearing a lot more about that before that big day comes. So that would be nice. Any other announcements? Yes, Jean. If you're interested, tickets go on sale on Tuesday for Steel Magnolias. So if you'd like to see me play at Grouchy Old Southern Woman, you can get tickets for that, and you can come and see the play at FMCT. And you posted some pictures of the costumes, too. They're very retro. They're very 80s. Yes, yes with big shoulder pads and uh, sort of like Golden Girls kind of thing. That's very cool. Nice homage to Betty White, you'd think. So, yeah, so uh, but Steel Magnolia is very cool. And so which, what character are you playing? I play Weeza, the, oh. the Shirley MacLaine play. Yes, of course. Oh, very good. That's, that's, dude, that's like, that's got made for you, isn't it? <laughs> you can, do you do it in an accent? Yes. Oh, I'm curious what that, to hear that accent. You had a coach come down? Well, Right. You can do anything on the internet these days. So, yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, some of us have Southern families, and our accents just go right into Southern very, very easily. So uh, it's not the Southern accents that are sometimes the hard ones, but it's those German accents that sometimes fall into sometimes, which some really awful coming from me. But anyway, go to Steel Magnolias. It's a great thing. Uh, if there's no other announcements, if you'll please stand, we'll sing our opening hymn. <laughs> Christ our Savior. Amen. 
sacraments may shine with the radiance of Christ's glory, that he may be known, worshipped, and obeyed to the ends of the earth, through Jesus Christ our Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. 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 Please be seated for our reading. A reading from the book of Isaiah. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest. Until her vindication shines out like the dawn and her salvation like a burning torch. The nations shall see your vindication and all the kings your glory. And you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more be termed forsaken and your land shall no more be termed desolate. But you shall be called, my delight is in her and your land married. For the Lord delights in you and your, and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your builder marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks, Thanks. be to the God. Our psalm is on page five, I think. <laughs> Thank you. 
reading from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were enticed and led astray to idols that could not speak. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking by the Spirit of God ever says, let Jesus be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each, <clears throat> excuse me, is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the discernment of spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are activated by one and the same Spirit who allots to each one individually just as the Spirit chooses. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. Jesus Christ according to John. Glory, Glory to you, Lord, Lord Christ. On the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, fill the jars with water, and they were filled up to the brim. He said to them, now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs, in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Christ. Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. So I'm going to start out with a hard question today. If I was going to ask you what it means to be a Christian, what is your definition? What makes you a Christian? What would your answer be? Let's hear it. 
Follow Jesus. Follow, follow Jesus. Jesus. Oh, good. That's a, that's that's actually a really good one. Okay. Follow what he taught. Exactly. Right. What else? Love one another. Love one another. You got it. Okay. I'm not even going to ask you anymore because you're taking my sermon away from me. I was hoping some of you would give a different answer. That's all right. Thank you, Saint Stevens. This is pure Saint Stevens. Okay. Well, it is an important question to ask. It really is. Uh, and maybe I should ask you this, and this should be the, probably the question. I, 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 this is the way. If it was proved beyond a doubt that the miracles of Jesus never happened, would that change your faith? No. Nope. Good. Okay. That's what we want to hear. Now, and I don't even know why I asked the rest of these questions, but I'm just going to go and ask them anyway because they were in my sermon, and I want to ask them. <laughs> You're emphatic no kind of defeated this, but here we're going to go. If it was proven beyond a doubt that the virgin birth never happened, that Jesus never walked on water or turned water into wine or raised the dead, would you still be able to call yourself a Christian? Yes. Yes. Okay. So the question is, is your faith dependent upon these supernatural aspects that we encounter in our gospel reading? Or is your faith based, as you guys already know, because you already answered this, on something else? These are important questions to ask ourselves sometimes. Now, last week, I preached about deconstruction. And just for those of you who might not have heard that sermon or heard me talk about it, deconstruction is about taking a really hard look at what we have believed as Christians and questioning those beliefs, essentially deconstructing them so that we can rebuild them in some other way. And it was a sermon, let me tell you, last week's sermon generated a lot of discussion. There was a lot of comments about it. A lot of people kind of liked it. Some people were going like, wow, that was was a hard sermon last week. Now, I had several people reach out to me to tell me that they also were in the same process of deconstructing their faith without even knowing there was a name for it. And I think a lot of us have been going through that. Well, I'm going to continue on with this deconstruction discussion today. Because if we answered, which none of you did, but if you had answered the question along these lines, uh, to be a Christian, and there are Christians who do actually answer this along these lines, one must believe as a Christian to believe that Jesus Christ is God, that Jesus Christ is the second person of the Trinity, co-equal with God, who was born of a virgin, who performed miracles, who raised himself from the dead, and we must believe all of those things without question to be a Christian. Well, that is what some people definitely believe. And if that is where people might be in their faith life, that might be a good reason for you to take a good, long, hard look at possible deconstruction of your faith. Because those are things that we should really examine. We shouldn't just say you have to believe these things without questioning why you believe these. If we really believe those things, that's a good thing. We can hold those beliefs close to us. Uh, We believe that these things are true, even if they might historically not have happened, but they're still true to us. Those beliefs can be true for us and might be very important for us in helping us understand our faith. But those things that I just mentioned, Jesus being the second person of the Trinity or being born of a virgin or performing miracles or raising himself from the dead, those are not what define us as Christians. And I know that's a hard thing for people to realize. There are many people who do not believe in those things, who, st- uh, uh, who don't hold those things to be factual, but who still call themselves Christians. And I really hate to break this news to any of you who might have that belief, which it doesn't sound like any of you here anyway do. Those things are not going to save you in the end. Nowhere in scripture does it say that believing in those things are the things that are going to guarantee you a place in the next world. And if it is proven that none of these things happen, and no one's ever going to prove those things, by the way, it's it's just not going to happen. But if those things were proved, the question we need to ask ourselves, if that's the way we believe, if those things were proved to be not true, would our faith as Christians still be intact? That's the really hard thing. Paul Tillich, a very famous theologian, one of his big bases for his theology was, if they found the bones of Jesus in the Middle East, Without a doubt, this is, these are the bones of Jesus. He actually was not resurrected from the grave. Would that be the end of Christianity? That's a really important question to ask ourselves. Would we stop being Christians if that happened? Trust me, it's never going to happen. But it's a good hypothetical to be throwing out there. 
And so, as I said, none of these, none of those kind of beliefs are necessarily going to save us according to scripture. But um, if those are the things that are going to destroy your faith, that's when you need to really consider your faith. You really need to look hard at your faith because those things should not, if those things were proven false or wrong or whatever, that those should not be the reasons for our faith failing. Because our faith is actually based, as you guys were just saying, based on loving God and loving your neighbor as yourself. That is based from Jesus himself saying that. If it is based on following Jesus, our faith is based on living out what Jesus taught, not only what he did for us or may have done for us. It is important for us to remember all of that in our spiritual journey in this life. Now, again, I'm not saying miracles don't happen. And I'm not saying that those miracles didn't happen. I know that miracles happen. Trust me, they do. I have experienced many, many miracles in my life. And I'm sure many of you have as well. And I do believe that miracles like we hear in our gospel reading for today, for example, really can happen. After all, Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the unique divine son of God. God worked and continues to work uniquely through the person of Jesus Christ. And if anyone could do it, we know that Jesus could do those things. Miracles, like the one at Cana, can still speak to us here and now where we are in this world. In our Gospel reading for today, of course, we do find this miracle of the wedding feast at Cana. We find in our Gospel reading for today that there is a problem at this wedding feast. The good wine has run out, and the wedding feast is probably going to crash pretty quickly. If this happens at a, at Annette and, and Mark's wedding, boy, we're going to be in trouble, right? The champagne runs up. I don't have the ability to change water into anything. anything. I don't. I'm sorry. So don't look to me. Look to, Jake. Look to, look to John Anderson. That's, he's the one. He can do that. Uh, it's a deacon's job, right? Deacon Suzanne, I think it is. Uh, you just never had that. You didn't know that in the ordination. Oh, it's in there. It's in the original Latin. But anyway, I think, uh, but Jesus turns this water, of course, into wine. And when he does, there really is a new, renewed sense of joy and exaltation at this wedding. That, I think, really is the gist of this experience of our gospel reading for today. This is not just some magic trick Jesus performs to wall the people. And it is not some action he performs at the whim of his mother. He performs this miracle, and in doing so, instills joy in those gathered around them. But more than that, by doing what he has done, uh, he, he performs this miracle, and it's a wonderful miracle. He performs a miracle not just for the benefit, though, of those people at that wedding. It is for our benefit as well. After all these eons later, that miracle was also being performed for us. Because by performing this miracle, he is giving us a glimpse of what awaits us beyond this world. If we look closely at the story and at some of the details contained in it, we will find clues of the deeper meaning of his action. First of all, let's look at those jars of water. That's a big part of this story. This is probably the one area that we don't give a lot of thought to. But those jars are really, really important. They are not just jars of regular water. They are jars of water for the purification rites that accompany the eating, uh, eating in the Jewish tradition. You had to wash your hands. You had to be clean before you ate because you could make the food impure if your hands were impure, so you had to wash. It was a big part of the, the whole process. This was part of the purification rite of Judaism at that time, and still is actually, it's still part of Judaism. If we think that purity isn't important though to us now, we really are wrong. Purity is important to us. Cleanliness and purity are still very much parts of our lives. So those stone jars at the wedding feast of Cana are not just for thirst. They're also about uncleanliness. Over and over and over again in the gospel readings, we, if, if you notice this, Jesus seems to have issues with these laws of purity. He really does have an issue with it. He's constantly battling them. Or rather, it's not so much the laws of purity probably that he's, he's having issues with, but he's, he has issues with the rituals that are all caught into the purity system. He has issues that they're putting, that people are putting too much emphasis on the laws rather than the spirit and the heart of the law behind these things. Just as Christians today sometimes put too much emphasis on the miracles and the dogmas of the church 
rather than on the real heart and spirit of those miracles and those dogmas. What we see him doing today is essentially a deconstruction of some of the traditional views on, on purity. And what a way to do it. I mean, if I could do that to do deconstruction, boy, I would, that would be great. They put me on the cover of People magazine, along with Betty White. Uh, he, he turns the waters of purity into wine. And he doesn't just turn it into any wine, but abundantly fine wine that brings about a joy to those gathered there. In a sense, what Jesus has done is he's taken the party up a notch. It's a beautiful image and one that we can all definitely relate to. We understand this image. We get it. This makes sense to us. Now, the best part of the view of the wedding at Cana is that Jesus is saying to us that, yes, there is joy here in the midst of all of this, but there is a greater joy awaiting us than this. A greater joy awaits us when the kingdom of God finally breaks through into our midst. A greater joy awaits us when, when God breaks through into our midst. When it, and when it does, when the kingdom of God breaks through into our midst, it is very much like a wedding feast. When it does, the waters of purification will be turned into the best tasting wine because we will no longer have to worry about issues like purity. In the kingdom of God, there is no issue of purity. There is no impurity in the kingdom of God. There is no sin. There is no racism. There is no homophobia or transphobia or sexism or ableism. To some extent, the wedding at Cana is a foretaste of what we do every Sunday and every Wednesday here at this altar. It is a foretaste of the Holy Eucharist, this meal that we share at the altar. And the Jesus that we encounter at this feast is not some sweet, obedient son doing whatever his mother says, though I truly believe there is almost a playful attitude between what Jesus and Mary are doing here today. I think, I think he's... He's playing with it. I think he's joking with it. Like a son would with his mother. I used to call my mom woman sometimes, just, just for fun. It was the way it was. And if she got mad, I'd say, Jesus did it to his mom. Why can't I do it to me? So um, both Mary and jo Jesus know who he is and what he can do. They know he is the Messiah. They know that he is this unique son of the Most High God. They know that because he is, he is able to do things that most people can't. Now, to be fair to Mary, because I'm always fair to Mary, I love Mary, you know I do, we must realize that at no point does she actually request anything from him, if you notice. All she does is state the obvious. There's no line, she says. Then she says to the servants, do whatever he asks. No one, if you ask, if you notice, asks him to perform any miracles. And that is important too. Now, I'm going to take all this one step further. I have a standard message at most of the, the weddings that I do. It, it's adapted to each couple, but if I've married you or your spouse in any way, you've heard me preach this sermon in a variation anyway. James and William, I did this for you guys, I know. Um, but uh, it's, it's pretty much the same. And the message carries with it my own understanding of how love and marriage works. Yes, how me, how I understand love and marriage, your celibate asexual priest, your aromantic asexual priest, giving you an idea about what I think about love and marriage. But this is what it is. So take it for what it's worth, right? So I say this at weddings. Love and marriage are a grace from God. But to truly understand that statement, we have to understand what grace is in this context. Now, my definition, as I preached a million times from this pulpit, my definition of grace is this. Grace is something God gives to us out of God's own goodness. Love and marriage are often, often, not always, but often, signs of grace. It is a gift that we're given from God that we don't ask for or even know how to ask for. God just grants it to us in God's own time. Now, oftentimes, the right person just comes into our lives at just the right time. And as some of you know, sometimes the wrong person comes into your life at the wrong time. Stephanie, right? <laughs> oh, we know, Stephanie. Anyway, so those things can happen. But the grace is sometimes the right person comes into our life at the right time. No matter how much we might want to control such situations, the fact is we simply can't sometimes. That person comes into our lives on God's terms, not ours. Oftentimes it happens when we least expect that person. But when they do come into our lives, our lives change. 
That is how grace works. God's grace changes our lives. We can't control God's grace. We can't even petition God and ask God for a particular grace. We can't do it. It doesn't work that way. Grace is just there because God chooses to grant us grace. That's how grace works. It just happens on God's own terms. Sometimes we might not even deserve the grace we get, but God, in God's goodness, just gives us this one right thing in our lives. And we can, and all we can do, in fact, in fact, the only thing that we can do in the face of that grace is simply say, thank you, God. Now to me, this only cements the fact that what happens at Cana happens each time that we gather here at this Eucharist. Here too, at this altar, we see Jesus reflected in that wine. And more importantly, in each other. Just like the wedding at Cana, this Eucharist we celebrate is a foretaste of the meal that we will all partake of in the kingdom. In that meal, the words that we heard in the prophet Isaiah this morning uh, will be spoken to each of us as well. And listen to this beautiful scripture. It's so wonderful. For the Lord will delight in you, and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your builder marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall God rejoice over you. God rejoices over you. In God, our truest and deepest joys will come springing forth. So as we come forward for communion this morning, let us do so with that image of the wedding feast at G and Cana in our hearts and in our minds. Let us look and see the image of Jesus reflected in the communion wine and in one another. Let us know that what we experience is not some magic trick. We come forward to a miracle. We come forward to a sign of God's kingdom breaking through into our very midst. We come forward to, take, to partake of this incredible grace. And all we can do in that holy moment is say, thank you, God. Let us pray. Loving God, you delight in bestowing your grace upon us and turning the water of our complacent ways into the wine of new understanding. Help us to see the miracles you perform in our midst in our everyday life. And when we do, help us to see with new eyes your reality in this world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 If you will please stand, and on page six, let us profess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternal God of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God. Begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things remain. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. He was incarnate of the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified on the conscious Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven. And is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again for glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who in the Father and the Son is the Lord and Lord of God, who has spoken to the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We live for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Jesus calls on us to follow him, and in doing so has promised that we will see angels ascending and descending. 
Let us call on God, on the God of Jesus for the needs, concerns, and hopes of all peoples, saying, God of Jesus, hear our prayer. For your church in every place, for Justin, the Archbishop of Canterbury, for the Church of England, for Michael, our presiding bishop, for the Episcopal Diocese of California, for Tom, our, our bishop, and the Diocese of North Dakota, for St. Sylvan's de Sioux, and the Diocesan Council in our local faith community, we pray for Northwestern Minnesota Synod of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, and for all who minister in your name, and for all the holy people of God, God of Jesus, hear our prayer. For this congregation of St. Stephen's, for Jamie our priest, for John our deacon, for John and Jessica our wardens, and for our vestry, and for all the ministries you call us to do, that we may embody your love and acceptance of all people and continue to be a safe place of refuge for those who seek you. We pray today, especially for Holly and Michael Eklund, Debbie Fahey, Craig Freer, Eric Froyland, Rachel and Jeff Froyland, Siri Froyland, for this holy gathering and for all the people of God, God of Jesus, hear our prayer. For Joe, our president in this country and its leaders, for all nations and their leaders, and for those who guard the peace, that the walls that divide us may be brought down. God of Jesus, hear our prayer. For those who suffer from the effects of racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, ableism, and any kind of abuse for being who they are, God of Jesus, hear our prayer. For the sick and suffering, for the dying, for the hungry and oppressed, and for those in prison, especially Michael, Shirley, Father Charles, Josh, Rebecca, and Samantha, God of Jesus, hear our prayer. For those who are hungry and for those who are oppressed and neglected, who are lonely and forgotten, for those in prison and for those in special need, especially Allison and Jordan, God of Jesus, hear our prayer. prayer. For all you have given in our lives, for our families, companions, and all those we love, and especially for all that we are thankful for. God of Jesus, hear our prayer. For our own intentions, repeated either silent, silently or aloud, I invite you now to share your prayer petitions at this time. By the work of Habitat for Humanity and those in need of adequate housing. God of Jesus, hear our prayer. For those who have gone before us and who now partake of the heavenly feast, which does not end, praying especially for Mary Borchius, George Olson, James Parsley, Nora Hale, and Dorothy Laburn, and for Carol, Albert, Janice, Elizabeth, and Charles. God of Jesus, hear our prayer. Join our voices with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Blessed Stephen the Martyr, and with all the saints of God. God of Jesus. Hear our prayer. 
God of grace, accept all we offer you this day as we look toward the glory you have promised us. This we ask in the name of Jesus our Savior. Amen. 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 And let us confess our sins against God and one another. God of all mercy, we confess yes, that we have sinned against you, opposing your will in our lives. We have denied your goodness in each other, in ourselves, and in the world you have created. We repent of the evil that has enslaved us, the evil we have done, and the evil done we have now. Forgive, restore, and strengthen us through our Savior Jesus Christ, that we may abide in the Father and serve only your will. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Savior Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I know we have some birthdays. Uh, it looks like we have Stephen Baird's birthday coming up this week, and we have Holly Eklund's birthday coming up this week. Are there any other birthdays on the list there, Donna? <coughs> No. Are there birthdays we should remember? First, oh, let's try it. Yeah. Um, we have a granddaughter whose birthday is today. Oh. Melissa. Melissa. How old is Melissa? 44. 44. Very good. Very good. Jean? Our niece, Julia. It'll actually be on the 23rd, but I imagine I'll forget. It'll be very busy that Of course. Day. So <laughs> let's pray for today. Where is she? She is actually at South Dakota uh, School of Mines. Oh, oh, really? Very cool. That's really cool. We'll send the prayers down to South Dakota. Anybody else we should be praying for for birthdays? My granddaughter, Rachel. Rachel? How old is Rachel going to be? Oh, 20 something. 20 something, yeah. <laughs> when you get in your 20s, it's all just 20 something, isn't it? And then it comes to a point where it's not. <laughs> uh, let's pray for everybody who has a birthday this coming week. So let us pray. Watch over your children, O Lord, as their days increase. Bless and guide them wherever they may be. Strengthen them when they stand. Comfort them and discourage your sorrow for all. Raise them up as they fall. And in their hearts may your peace, which passes understanding, abide all the days of their lives. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Good blessing on everybody who's having a birthday this week. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I see we have a baptism, Katie's baptism anniversaries this week. Okay, Katie, do you remember where you were baptized? You don't remember, but do you know where you were baptized? Uh, Trinity Luther. Trinity Luther, what was that? Uh, Morehead. Oh, Trinity. Oh, oh yeah, Pet Trinity, the big one. Yeah, we know which one that is. Well, oh, very good. Uh, that was, that's great. Well, uh, how many years ago was that? 20 years ago. Okay, very good. 20 years, 20 years ago? Was, oh, wow. That's not that long ago when we started thinking about that. Okay, well, uh, happy baptism anniversary. We're going to pray for you on your baptism anniversary, Katie. And if there's any baptism anniversaries out there in uh, live stream land, put them out there and we'll pray for them as well. So let's pray for Katie on her baptism anniversary. In baptism, O oh God, your servant was received into the household of God and filled with the light of Christ. Sustain her gracious God in your Holy Spirit. Continue to give her an inquiring and discerning heart, the courage to will and to persevere, a spirit to know and to love you, and the gift of joy and wonder in all your works. May we walk always as children of the light and keep the flame of faith alive in our hearts. May we live each day knowing our true identity as beloved children of God. And when Christ comes, may we go out to meet him of all the saints in the heavenly kingdom, to live with him forever and ever. Amen. And a blessing, Katie, on you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. And we have a wedding anniversary. Oh, how many years has it been? 32. 32, did you say? Okay, what year was that? 89? 90, 90, very good. Greta and Verdell are celebrating their wedding anniversary. It was right here at St. Stephen's, right? Yeah. Very good. So we're gonna, are you gonna do anything special? Verdell, are you doing anything special for your anniversary? I wanna be done with <laughs> <laughs> Well, go all out. <laughs> 
flip the light fantastic or whatever the saying is, good. You're going to hit the town, right? <laughs> Rent a limo to go to McDonald's. Right? Very good. Well, I'm very happy for 32 years. That's a good long haul, isn't it? Yeah, it's second marriage. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. As, at first, and for a second marriage, for both of you, yes, that's right, yes. That's pretty darn good. A lot of, well, okay, I need to do this real quick because that sermon I gave just now about grace in our lives, you get one grace in your lives and you're pretty happy. Look at that, two graces in your life. That's something to be very thankful for. So, sorry, I didn't mean to go off onto a sermon about that, but it's a really beautiful thing. It is a really beautiful thing. So because of that, we really should celebrate that. So let us pray and give you a blessing on your the second graces in both of your lives. So let us pray. Oh God, the giver of all that is true and lovely and gracious, grant that by your Holy Spirit, these your servants may continue to become one in heart and soul, live in fidelity and peace, and obtain those eternal joys prepared for all who love you. For the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And Greg and Verdell, a blessing upon you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And many more years to come for your, your wonderful grace in your life. I think that's all. That's all. Uh, I got a little teary there. That was kind of nice. Uh, the peace of Christ be always with you. Peace, everybody. <laughs> Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself as an offering and sacrifice to God. continues on page 10. creation with your blessing and fed us with your constant love. You have redeemed us in Jesus Christ and knit us into one body. Through your spirit you replenish us and call us to fullness of life. Therefore, joining with angels and archangels and with the faithful of every generation, we lift our voices with all creation as we say...
Blessed are you, gracious God, creator of the universe and giver of life. You formed us in your own image and called us to dwell in your infinite love. You gave the world into our care that we might be our faithful stewards and show forth your bountiful grace. But we fail to honor your image in one another and on ourselves. We would not see your goodness in the world around us, and so we violated your creation, abused one another, and rejected your love. Yet you never ceased to care for us and prepared the way of salvation for all people. Through Abraham and Sarah, you called us into covenant with you. You delivered us from slavery, sustained us in the wilderness, and raised up prophets to renew your promise of salvation. Then, in the fullness of time, you sent your eternal word, made mortal flesh in Jesus. Born into the human family and dwelling among us, he revealed your glory. Giving himself freely to death on the cross, he triumphed over evil, opening the way of freedom and life. On the night before he died for us, our Savior Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his friends and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After, as supper was ending, Jesus took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ is died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Remembering his death and resurrection, we now present to you from your creation this bread and this wine. By your Holy Spirit, may they be for us the body and blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grant that we who share these gifts may be filled with the Holy Spirit and live as Christ's body in the world. Bring us into the everlasting heritage of your daughters and sons, that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Blessed Stephen the Martyr, and all your saints, past, present, and yet to come, we may praise your name forever. Through Christ, and with Christ, and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, to you be honor, glory, and praise forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. takes away the sins of the world. Happy are we who are called to this supper, and everyone here is, of course, welcome to receive Holy Communion. This is Jesus' table, but let us pray for those who at this time cannot receive Holy Communion. God of infinite mercy, we thank you for Jesus, our Savior, who feeds us and gives us eternal life. We pray for those who cannot be here at this time, 
to consume these gifts of his body and blood in this bread and wine, but we pray that they may receive the sacrament of Christ's presence, the forgiveness of sins, and all other benefits of Christ's passion. Grant that we may all continue forever in the risen life of our Savior, who with you in the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen.
Now send us forth a people forgiven, healed, renewed, that we may proclaim your love to the world and continue in the risen life of Christ our Savior. Amen. And may Almighty God, who led the Magi by the shining of a star to find the Christ, the light from light, lead you also in your pilgrimage to find the Lord. Amen. Amen. May God, who sent the Holy Spirit to rest upon the only begotten at his baptism in the River Jordan, Pour out that spirit on you who have come to the waters of new birth. Amen. Amen. May God, by the power that turned water into wine at the wedding feast at Cana, transform your lives and make glad your hearts. Amen. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer be with you now and always. Amen. Amen. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.
Good morning. Good to see you. Yes, of course. Nice. <laughs>